Hello everyone, uh, thanks for stopping by. My name is Boris, I'm a product designer and I've been focused on developer experience for the last couple of years in my career. Um, recently I joined Elastic. Elastic helps the world's leading organization accelerate results that matter by putting data to work with the power of search. And uh, today we're going to talk about designing for developers. Uh, I'll try to go through a couple of like programming and web fundamentals. I'll also try to apply different design methods, tools and practices, which at the end I hope, uh, I hope it will help you and guide you of understanding what designing for developers is and how to gain more empathy for this specific audience. And yeah, let's start. Of course, knowing that before we start, we need to clearly give some kind of a definition of the world experience before we actually start talking about developer experience, right? So I did my research and I checked uh, what experience is in terms of a definition. It's a particular instance of personally encountering or undergoing something. And yeah, something, something can be anything, right? So right now you're listening to this uh, like uh, conference talk in the format of the screen, uh, showing you a couple of slides and me standing here at the bottom, um, like in the bottom corner of, uh, of the monitor. So we could easily say that we, uh, you're currently experiencing what nowadays we call a digital conference. So then this brings us a second question. Once we know what the experience is, uh, what is like a good uh, experience, right? Let's try to think about my presentation as something that we experience. It's something like a product or a service. Uh, what would make our experience good? I would say definitely not something like this, right? Maybe if I was not even here in the, in the frame itself, it would make it even weirder because what you're seeing right now is like just a static um, type of a, a slide with a couple of like texts on it with different sizes, different colors. Some of them are alarming. Some of them are like structured differently. This whole thing makes a lot of like weird, like weird stuff, right? If you also look a little bit deeper and closer, you can actually see that the description it doesn't make any kind of sense. Uh, to install first, open the disk image. It's talking about media, convert to or anything. So yeah, this is kind of uncomfortable if you think about it from an experience point of view, especially in the context of a presentation and in the context of a digital conference, right? So if we want to summarize what were the three main things that were wrong in this experience, I would easily go with the first one, which is like aesthetics. So everything related to the structure, to the layout, to the choices that we made about the colors, about the fonts, about the sizes, about the balance of each of those slides. Uh, the second would be definitely the interaction. So I'm sure you felt how weird it was when I immediately went outside of the, even the small block that I have uh, for myself at the bottom of the screen, if I was outside of the frame, just talking things out without even knowing that people are like listening. So that way interact in, from interaction point of view, it felt a bit strange, right? And uncomfortable. And yeah, last but not least, it's the idea. So you saw that the description itself was talking something about like media annotation to an installation, which is totally irrelevant in the context of a developer experience, right? But the idea is actually one of the most important pieces of a great experience because it's the one that is keeping the, the whole story together. And together we are here to talk about developer experience, not about media annotation tools and like uncomfortable presentations, right? So if we apply those three principles to any kind of product or service, we can easily say that those are the guiding principles for a good experience, right? So that means that for user experience point of view, a user experience is a developer experience if the user is a developer. So that means that we can actually straight up saying what is a good developer experience? Well, a good developer experience is only if we know the clear definition of a developer experience first. So that means uh, in the context of our presentation, the journey and the interactions and feelings a developer is going through while getting a job done. It can be in the context of libraries, documentation, frameworks, open source solutions, general tooling, APIs, anything. But it's about getting it done while going through interactions, feelings and the journey itself. Then if we want to ask ourselves what is a good developer experience, well, then a lot of questions I think are rising up from multiple directions, <laughs> I believe like questions like are we talking about the documentation are we talking about like getting started and onboarding as part of the documentation it should be somewhere outside of it what about code samples maybe the format is also important should it be open source we know that if it's an open source it will be like with a higher impact and with a lot of feedback loops because we're going to be talking with a lot of people but then we should also consider how we handle monetization uh, is it based on requests is it based on something else should it be free we don't know do we have some kind of a developer like profile or package that we can uh, offer to our consumers? Uh, what about like things like naming conventions and best practices? All those type of questions 
can uh, lead us like uh, trying to figure out what is a good developer experience. But uh, by having a definition of what a good developer experience is, we can actually answer all those questions at the same time. A good developer experience allows for an effective and a joyful way of solving engineering problems and tasks. Um, let's try to take this concept with the principles of aesthetics, interactions and the idea and try to create like a pattern or like a journey of, a, of an engineer with the main steps that they're going through. Of course, this is not always the case, but just as a directional purpose for, our, for the case of our talk. We have a section for, onboard, for onboarding where we talk about the documentation and the resources, the samples, understanding and learning about the tool, the library or the framework or even the language. Then the second part would be more about the building itself. So going to uh, like uh, details about how to construct, for example, applications, how to use methods and how to debug, debug things and deploy them. And last but not least, it will be mainly focused on the maintaining part, which is about observability, monitoring, analyzing the data and then iterating on top of it to create like a better version, even from performance point of view. So by knowing those three main groups, we can actually jump into the three main topics that we can discuss in this talk. <coughs> I've tried to split them in three, hopefully interesting for all of you. Um, first one is called machine application and language, where I'll try to uncover what is the fundamental job of an engineer. So that way we can actually get a better understanding of the engineer as a persona. The second part is more about the API as a product and something can be designed for a like, good developer experience. And last but not least, it will be, it's called tools of the trade, but it's something that's mainly focused on tools and how do they uh, um, solve uh, the case for onboarding especially because this is an essential part uh, of the developer experience uh, a journey mm. so let's start i guess uh, the first part will be about machine application and language i think in order for us to start feeling empathetic for our for our audience and to understand our persona i think we need to understand why are we here and what's the reason to have this conversation well the com reason for the conversation is uh, this one the computer uh, the computer machine is meant to perform tasks for us, right? But those tasks uh, became quite overcomplicated uh, with time, right? It can be literally anything can be assumed as a, like a computer task. Checking the weather, adding something to my cart, sending a Slack message, I don't know, booking and paying your dog walker or something. Like all those things are considered to be tasks nowadays. But tasks are also constrained in some way, so they need to be wrapped in something which is contextually relevant because it's gonna. There are mega applications which are doing all those things at the same time, but you know, booking and paying your dog walker by also sending like a Slack message to your teammate in the same space would feel pretty strange, right, from an experience point of view. So that's why we have applications. Applications are the wrapping forms of all the commands and functionalities that we want to execute in the context of the one that they're running. And I wanted to share a couple of examples of different applications so that way we know what we're talking about. The first one is, let's say, Microsoft Word, application which allows you to write documents, right? The second one is uh, Spotify, which is allowing you to access and browse collections of albums, artists, songs, and podcasts, and listen to them, of course. Uh, Visual Studio Code, which is like a source uh, editing uh, application which actually allows you to edit the source code of applications and make changes on, on them. Last but not least, another example is Firefox, which is a web browser software, which is allowing you to access and browse the World Wide Web or like local documents on your own machine. And yeah, you see how diversified the applications and their context can be. Um, it's also important to mention that, like, for example, you can actually spin up Spotify in Firefox and create and like enjoy a web-based experience because Spotify is supported by the web uh, browser. But then if we know that actually Spotify is running on uh, Firefox, then what is Firefox running on if that's the case? Well, it's actually running on like a system software. So in this can, uh, context and this slide, it's like a Mac OS. And the system software is me meant to access the memory and the processing aspects of the hardware. And uh, that's the only, uh, that's the reason for uh, having this type of a graph. You understand what the correlation and the connection between each of the apps and the, like, let's say, uh, software solutions are. Um, if we know this at the end, we can actually start asking a couple of questions. Okay, but how do you access that CPU and how do you execute commands? And how is the machine, like the computer, actually understanding what we are talking about? Um, I've prepared a pretty simple example, so that means that we're gonna jump into like a recording mode of the actual example. I'm gonna keep talking. I'm gonna keep talking about it on top of it, but you're gonna check the recording now. So what you're supposed to see right now 
uh, is like uh, yeah three terminal windows uh, opened at the same time the one on the left you're seeing like a bunch of numbers uh, looping up endlessly 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 and if i try to stop them up uh, you'll see that it's just a couple of numbers one after another and they're repeating themselves in a loop as i said and if you want to look even deeper and if you understand basic mathematics this is just a fibonacci sequence which is running until this specific number and then it goes again and again and again until we stop it and yeah this is pretty normal i guess if like considered understandable from human point of view but what about if you want to build this as a like a simple program so that way we can actually execute it in the computer like the one that we are doing right now well that's why we have the screen in the middle which is trying to communicate something in a high level language c for example and it's trying to communicate the same exact thing that we are seeing from a human point of view on the left you have the xyz variables and you also have the conditions until which they are met and how the combination of the formula should work and until which number it should come up and then spin up and loop again and that's totally fine but if you want to understand how a machine actually understand this program itself then we can look up at the screen on the uh, most right which in this case is going to be the <coughs> uh, the machine language representation which is like a low level language with little to no abstraction which is the most optimal way of how you can actually access the processing power and the cpu or the cpu of the computer machine mm. what i'm trying to say here with this example um, i'm gonna also leave links uh, to like interesting resources that you can check by yourself uh, in the meantime after the like the chat itself and the presentation mm. What I want to conclude with this point is that we can easily say that uh, developers, one way or another, are like translators between humans and machines. They're giving us, they're using their knowledge and power to compile like communication between us and the machines. And that's amusing. You can see that even in the slide themselves. Like on the one side, you have the user with the basic number structure of the Fibonacci. Then you have the formula and the program created by the, the programmer. And then in the end, the executable form of the machine language representation. And once we figure that part out as a core principles of what an engineering job is consisting of, we can slowly transition in uh, like core principles and core products and services that they're using on a daily basis to support their work. But before we start giving definitions about like packaging or APIs, SDKs, etc., I think it's a good opportunity to share like something from my personal experience. So back in 2014, I was working on like a media annotation tool with an engineering group. Uh, it was quite of an exciting project because you were able to actually like try to solve problems which are not common on a daily basis. Uh, so I was always inspired and creative in my ways of how I can solve certain problems. But I was constantly stumbling up into a wall by hearing that most of the solutions that you see are like too custom and it will take a lot of time for them to be developed. And I was keep asking myself, why was that happening? I was constantly needing to like cut things out and not to be in control of how the product can de uh, develop, be developed or be designed. Um, so I started asking questions around, still thankful for all the engineers nowadays that helped me and guided me through finding my ways. Uh, but the ways were quite actually direct and uh, simple now, but complex back then. It was just two things. They said, uh, please learn bootstrap and foundations because those are the CSS frameworks that we use daily in order to create scalable and effective interfaces in order to solve problems. So if I'm able to understand how bootstrap and foundations work, I'll be able to actually allow myself to be like creative in the constraints that I've created myself based on the frameworks that the project is working on. So I started developing things uh, alongside, understand how bootstrap and foundations are being designed and how they can be used and what they're capable of doing which slowly brought me to actually building my own packages and my own libraries so that way I can actually create the projects I want to and scale them the way I see it's right, which was quite of a nice experience. It allowed me to open up uh, another world in terms of how design can be achieved and design can be worked on, something to focus more on the tools that are uh, there and how you can use them in order to build and create like nice applications and nice solutions. So this brings us to the second part of the chat, which is more about the API as a product and a service that's being uh, consumed by developers and something that can be assumed as a good developer experience. So as I said, once you figure out what, uh, how deep the rabbit hole is and how many possibilities you can get from different solutions, different APIs, you actually understand how big, collaborative, effective, interesting and joyful the world of development is. Creating tools to help others build things is a magical interaction and in my opinion is one of the core actually principles of what developers are doing nowadays. 
they end up reading about those new tools and they're trying to test them out and figure things out if they're going to make sense in the context and the problems that they're trying to solve. Uh, but before we jump into like uh, examples of API experience, I would just briefly give it like a simple definition of an API, which stands for application programming interface and allows your application to interact with external services using a simple set of commands. And uh, if we start talking about APIs, which we are already doing, we already see that, uh, yeah, APIs, APIs are everywhere. So if you want to access some kind of weather data, you go and get a uh, weather API. If you want to get some kind of... Um, food data and nutrition based tracking application type of data you already you go to the food data api and start consuming it if you want to actually even build interface you can use a design system as an api and start uh, recreating applications with the already predefined rules that are being created and a lot of applications are built that way so we have users of applications we have teams building an application who are also the consumers of the different apis which means that they're the already like uh, concept that you have like a user who's using an application and then the application is being designed by a team is not uh, relevant anymore. Things are way, way more complex. Uh, this is just a very simplified version of how you can look at it. But if we say we have a weather application that's being used by a user here, the developer who's maintaining and building the application is actually consuming a weather app, like weather API in order to render the data and show that uh, the temperature right now, for example, in Amsterdam or in New York is that and this whether in Celsius or in Fahrenheit. But in order for the API to be like scalable and to work and to provide all the different like locations, for example, and the different like, uh, yeah, the different locations, that means that there is a team who's supporting and maintaining it all the time, whether through the product itself, which is the API, or through the portal, which will be the things like documentation and the way how you can actually understand what the API is capable of doing. So this uh, brings us to the second part, which is more about focusing on uh, like two like super simple and direct examples of API experience for developers so that way we could figure things out better all together. Uh, one of those examples is Stripe as one of the already established let's say examples of a, a good developer experience. Uh, why? Because uh, Stripe is actually handling the transactions from one bank account to another when you want to purchase things online and buying things on the, inter on the internet nowadays has become like a normal thing. We all assume that we can actually uh, buy things uh, like online all the time from every like any location like anything literally but how to create the experience of, uh, of actually transitioning or transferring the money from one account to another may feel daunting or even hard to understand so stripe is actually trying to solve that uh, bridge and let me show you an example like if you have like a variable for an invoice with uh, like different payment method types the most common that we already know is the one that we define as a card but there are other examples which are like important to mention and to show what Stripe is doing in order to like simplify things. Like a lot of countries uh, in the world, they have their own like their own online protocol for transferring like uh, money from one account to another. So, for example, in the Netherlands, you have a, th a thing called Ideal. In Singapore, you have something called PayNow. In Brazil, it's called Boleto, and in Austria, it's called EPS, and many others. So how Stripe is trying to achieve that? Well, it just allows you to render like an array of all the possible payment method types that you want to use in your like payment flow. So that way you can actually support a wider range of types and methods, which can easily be shown on the screen without any kind of hassle. So you don't need to care either to think of how to integrate Ideal, Boleto or EPS or PayNow in order to make your like product more scalable and easy to use for all kinds of people from different countries uh, around the world which is uh, kind of a smooth experience. <coughs> I'm sorry, um, the second part uh, and the second example which I wanted to pick up, it was more about building interface, Tailwind CSS, and if we should try to think about it as an API that can be consumed. Uh, CSS is like a framework which is trying to uh, allow you like an easier way for you to design applications in a faster way, uh, mainly stylistically. It's one of the most popular like uh, packages and uh, CSS frameworks downloaded on the NPM registry with like, I don't know, 100 million downloads now or even more. They're counting daily. Mm, but what they're trying to achieve is something quite interesting because let's check this example. What you're seeing right now is just a simple card. The card is like a construction of a couple of like, let's say in this context, HTML elements, which are having a, like a list of styles. 
but the styles themselves are not giving us any kind of insights whether this is like a cart or like a wrapper or this is like an avatar or anything you're we are just using like utility based approach which is actually giving us a lot of flexibility it maybe look like daunting and a bit like um, long as an experience but at the end what it brings and gives us is just a predefined set of rules in the CSS which will limit us of the uh, which will limit us from the creation of custom uh, uh, custom rules and it will be just custom combinations based on the already created utilities which will mean that the CSS file for example will never grow bigger as the one that we have already added but we just need to be creative enough in order to combine things accordingly so what does that mean? That means that if I want to add a flex, I just add a, a flex style so that way I can apply it as a display property of my uh, like wrapper. If I want to center things, um, I will just apply an item center class. If I want to make uh, the avatar in a certain size, I will just apply H for height, W for width, and then a certain number, which numbers can also be represented in the config files of uh, Tailwind CSS. So that means you can actually create your own version of uh, how you want to customize things based on like scale. Of course, there are things like text properties and like text uh, color properties, which are also very scalable and you can actually apply them and create like configurations based on your own preferences, which shows the diversity and like the richness of uh, what Tailwind CSS allows us to do. But once we know those two things as examples, then another question comes to my mind, like what happens when you want to update things and like improve them? Because that's a core principle of what design is and designing each product requires for it to be improved with the previous version. Well, from developer point of view, uh, this example has already been sorted up. Like if we assume that Tailwind or like Stripe in this context, we're gonna release a new version. Me as a developer who's actually consuming their APIs need to be like confident enough that those things will not change my application, right? Because um, yeah, this is kind of an important deal and versioning is being out there for quite some time. I'll try to briefly talk about it knowing that everybody knows about it, but an application is not considered to be just a wrapper where we can actually put uh, any kind of isolated functionality in order for things to work out. Applications nowadays, they look a little bit something like this, where you have external dependencies which are entering the app and they're mixing up with other external develop, uh, uh, dependencies and internal functionalities and they create the final result that we are seeing right now. So let's say if I want to update Tailwind CSS or Stripe as we spoke before. Me as an engineer who's actually building things up, I need to communicate clearly to my users who are other engineers uh, of what is going on and what will be the changes, whether it will break some uh, things and how they, uh, those things can be changed. This is why semantic versioning has been thought of as a core principle and a good example of a good developer experience. We, saw, we see those uh, like three numbers at the end of each package which are trying to communicate also the level of change that is being made to the new version. So that is, I think this is a pretty good example of how developer experience can allow for an effective communication between people. Um, I'm saying all those things because I believe it's very important to understand the core principles and the core like fundamental rules of how a developer experience works because that's the best way to see what you're capable of doing, right? Um, I'm not going to quote anyone here, I'm just going to leave uh, this person, one of the most inspiring designers uh, out there. His name is Henry Dreyfus and he's considered to be one of the first designers to articulate and then act on the idea that design wasn't just about styling. It sprang from a knowledge about knowing how things are being made and what they're uh, like what was possible so by knowing what is possible on our on our end as a like let's say the developer engineering product we can actually assume what we can actually do with it and upgrade that uh, upgrade the experience the way we want just by knowing what uh, we can do because um, developer experience is not something that you can just easily install uh, in your like either organization or just for your product or service um, it requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of empathy to be built in order to understand what are the core like uh, direction guides and principles involved. Which slowly allows us to transition into the like let's say final part uh, of the talk which will be mainly focused on like the onboarding journey or like the power of the documentation. We see how important communication is nowadays for an effective developer experience. So the growth of developer relations and advocacy is something that's essential for every product. But the documentation itself is actually something that has been around for quite some time and it's considered to be like one of the most important pieces of each uh, experience, uh, like product experience, especially knowing that uh, the product itself has some kind of a developer engineering type of an offering. 
Uh, I've picked two examples with a good like documentation practices just so I could show the diversity, but at the same time the um, uh, like guiding principles that we've defined in the beginning about the aesthetics, interaction and the idea. Uh, the first one uh, is from Next.js and yeah, Next.js already provide their uh, robust documentation about the already like experienced and well-knowledge users where they can actually figure things out about routing, authentication, deploying, testing, even learn about how their API works so they can actually like, I don't know, fetch data or do things which are a bit more complicated. But there is also another section which is part of um, the Next.js uh, structure which is about uh, learning things as you go which is uh, fundamentally amazing and it was something that didn't exist like back in the days, let's say it like that. So what the Next.js Learn section is trying to provoke us uh, uh, of doing is to go from fundamental JavaScript knowledge to React framework specificities by following different examples, by winning points and gamification in order to learn how to build a full, ready, full already blown application. Uh, what does that mean? Well, people already vo uh, vocaling things out as a great way of how you can experience things out. But at the end, the good part is that you already have, like once you finish all the steps and all the, let's say, learning part of the documentation, you already have a full-blown document uh, web product working, which you can actually style on and continue uh, using, which is a very good example of like interaction and idea perceptually. And also from an aesthetic point of view, it's pretty nice that you start from very basic and core principles to something which is very specific in the context of Next.js and React. <coughs> The second part, which I wanted to, uh, like the second example, which I wanted to talk about was uh, from the CLI, uh, let's say group. CLI is a command line interface, and it's something that has been around for quite some time. Uh, in the 60s, for example, that was the only way of how you can interact with a computer. So this was way before the dominance of the graphical interface and the things that we know nowadays as something of a norm. Back then, everything was in a verbose form where you actually requesting and making commands so that way the machine can actually give you a response back and that way you can continue with your like interaction. So CLIs are integrated part of uh, any like developer experience work nowadays. Mm, I wanted to give one example of a good onboarding experience where like the core principles that we've defined in the beginning like uh, aesthetics, interaction and idea are a part of and this example is called uh, Vim. Vim uh, Vim is a highly configurable text editor built to make creating and changing any ty uh, type of text or like kind of text very efficient. Um, I'm gonna switch into a recording mode so I could show you what uh, and how this is looking in, in the context of an onboarding uh, for a CLI tool uh, and I hope it will be pretty like interesting and inspiring. So what's happening here on the screen is that yeah you open up the terminal and uh, once you open up the terminal you can run a specific command which is called Vim Tutor. And once the command is running, you actually open a text document with lessons and tutorials that you can follow along to get yourself started confident in using Vim as a text editor. And the fascinating part from interaction point of view here is that you see that there is a first document and like a first lesson, but you also see that there is like a second lesson. So in order to go to the second lesson, you need to learn how uh, learn yourself of how to move things around, like up and down or left and right. So this is the first lesson that uh, VimTutor is trying to teach you how to move and navigate yourself through the document. Once you build that part, you can actually go to the second lesson, which will be main, uh, which is now focusing on how to exit this state because this text document state is like specific only for the tutorial point of view, and this is also core principles of how you enter Vim in like Vim edit mode of uh, text files. So that means you can exit the mode and then you can easily go back by just running a command. And later on, you can actually in about 30 minutes feel confident enough to easily edit, delete, insert text, or even running commands for like replacing, copying, past pasting and appending like text values. I highly recommend this as a great example for an onboarding to, uh, to something new because you jump right into the doing of things. Uh, there is no need to read things along. You can experiment and get an instant feedback and I think this is a very nice approach of how you can learn things, um, especially from developer point of view. Just a FYI, because a friend of mine shared this recently, yeah, uh, Twitter is also using Vim like shortcuts, which means that yeah, you can actually navigate up and down in Twitter with the same type of commands that you're, you're using in Vim, which is kind of a, a, a nice feature. Uh, but anyway, I think it's time to wrap this up and uh, I hope my talk gave you like a better understanding of what developer experience might be and how robust and rich and endless it actually is.
um, I think one of the most important conclusions that we can do at the end of this talk is uh, the power of the metaphor. The power of the metaphor was the one that allows the, trans uh, the transfer of the ideas from one specialized domain to another. So things like computer languages, like APIs, CLIs, versioning, Git, all those things are metaphors that we've created ourselves in order to make the domain of computer science closer to the human domain, which is kind of an exceptional thing. And if we think about metaphors, we shouldn't like always pick on an example, like a simple example to make the statement a bit clearer. So for example, saying the internet is like a web of information connected with links, which are spread and can be accessed from any location in the world, tells you a lot what the web is for. It also implies what you might do with it and what even you might invent on top of it which is kind of an interesting approach because we are using metaphors which are now so embedded in our experience and our daily lives that they seem second nature. But at the end, those are the metaphors that we've designed ourselves as part of the experience that we want to bring. So I think as a conclusional part of our chat, we can uh, wrap this up, as I said from the beginning, with four like directional motifs or like topics that we can take as conclusions. So the first one uh, would be deep dive and do your research. Despite the fact if we're talking about machine languages or like versioning, all those things are bringing you uh, like closer and closer to the persona that you're trying to investigate. In this case, it was the developer itself. Uh, the second part is understand the good practices, which is also related to the research part. Knowing how, to, uh, how the best practices are already applied in the industry would give you way, way more confidence and uh, like knowledge of how you can actually uh, bend them the way you feel things are right from uh, like design point of view. Um, the third one, and of course, last but not least, is the Henry Dreyfus way. Uh, so yeah, learn by doing, do things along, so that way you can actually get inspired. And the last one is, yeah, actually get inspired and be open from uh, inspiration from every direction. Uh, thanks for stopping by at my uh, like talk. You can always reach out and have a conversation. And I hope I see you soon again. Uh, thanks. Bye. <laughs>